welcome to this late afternoon conversation on black theology and white terror. Looking at that title this afternoon, I thought it should be black theology and white Christian terror. I'm Serene Jones, the president of Union Theological Seminary and the Johnston Family Chair in Religion and Democracy. And I'm joined this afternoon by my two colleagues, the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who is the Dean of EDS at Union and the holder of the Moyers Chair in Theology and a powerful leading voice in black theology in our nation. And the Reverend Fred Davey, Executive Vice President at Union who played a major role in Warnock's Senate campaign, who serves on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, the New York State COVID-19 Vaccine Equity Task Force, and is chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York City. I could spend the whole 45 minutes just talking about the work of Kelly and Fred, but we really want to get into the conversation. And I want to say that tonight is just the beginning of this topic. We will be continuing in the weeks to come with other voices because we are not in any way claiming to be singular experts on this topic. There are many other union faculty, alums, and students who could be on this screen as well. Today, what we're doing is just opening up in public our own three-way conversation and inviting you into it. As many of you are aware, during Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock's campaign, the now Senator-elect was frequently attacked because of his connections to Union and more specifically to Black liberation theologian, the late James Cone. These were vicious, racist, and gross distortions of what Black theology is and has been. The specter of white supremacist terrorizing rhetoric was all over the campaign, just as it has been a demonic force in our nation for almost 400 years. But in Georgia, the victory was ours. Congratulations again to our alumnus, Senator-elect Warnock. God, it sounds so good to say that. But having said that, we still got lots to talk about. Little did we know that on the heels of that celebratory morning this past Wednesday, the U.S. Capitol would be attacked by domestic terrorists whose gross sense of entitlement, whose twisted theology, and whose unabashed violence was blatant white Christian terror. The whiteness and the Christianness of it there is too little being said about that. And it's a topic about which black theology has a lot to say. For instance, why is the public not talking more about the huge noose that was erected in the middle of the attack, a literal physical lynching tree on the 2020 Capitol lawn? So here we go, black theology and white Christian terror. Kelly, will you jump in and get us going? Thank you, uh, Serene. And it is uh, really a privilege to be a part of this conversation with you and Fred. And I thank all of you who have joined us uh, in the listening audience for this conversation. Let me begin by saying that I think what we saw on last Wednesday, uh, we can talk about that in two ways. The first thing that uh, this told us was something about the nation. Here you had just Serene, as you pointed out, on the one hand, we have in Georgia, the election of uh, Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnack uh, and his running mate, uh, and so we have Democrats, if you will, taking over uh, uh, the Senate seats in Georgia. On the other hand, on this same day, in the same 24 hour period, we see this uh, white terrorist attack up on the Constitution. Now, 
what's going on here? This is a reflection of, on the one hand, the nation's white supremacist, Anglo-Saxon exceptionalist identity, the foundation upon which this nation was built that is indeed engraved into our very constitution. So you have that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you have fleeting as it may have been in the Declaration of Independence, you have this vision, right? That I say is the vision that emerges from the soul of our nation, this vision to indeed be a nation where everyone can enjoy the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These two things have come into conflict once again with one another. Why has it come into conflict in such a visceral and visible and vile way? Because this nation elected a vision to make America great again, elected a president who clearly right, uh, identifies with the white supremacist foundation of this country. And so he, all he did was let that genie back out out of the bottle and gave it energy. When this happens, when it has that, that white supremacist foundation has such energy, we, it is inevitable that this country will erupt into some kind of civil war. That's what the uh, uh, initial civil war was all about, right? The difference in that civil war is not so much that we had a leader that believed in black equality, because uh, uh, he didn't, but what we did have was a leader who believed in the unity of the nation. We don't have that in this leader. We have someone who is a white supremacist as well as someone who does not believe in the unity of the nation. So we saw that, right? We have Raphael on the one hand and the white supremacist chair on the other. That's what we can say about the nation. People who are going around and saying that this is not who we are, no, no, this is who we are. And until we come to grips with that, we're going to continue to have uh, these civil war uh, eruptions. Then let me say this briefly on the other hand in terms of uh, white Christian America. We have to come to grips with the fact when we talk about this vision to make America great again. We know that four years ago, people made a big deal out of the fact that 80, over 80 some percent of white evangelical uh, Protestants voted for this vision. And we know what this vision, we knew what it meant then and we certainly know what it means now. What people miss or don't talk about so much is the fact that not simply 80 some percent of white evangelical Protestants voted for this vision, but the majority of white Christian America voted for this vision. Over 50% of non-evangelical white Protestants, almost 60% of white Catholics voted for this vision. W.E.B. Du Bois once said that if a nation's religion is its life, then white Christianity is a miserable failure. What we have seen and what black theology has talked about uh, uh, for years as the legacy of a Frederick Douglass who understood the reality of the slave bell and the church bell ringing in together is that there's something about uninterrogated whiteness that when it comes together with Christianity, it creates this white Christian nationalism. Until we began to tell the truth about that and recognize that one cannot at once be white. And when we think of that in terms of this racial construct of whiteness that suborns white supremacy and Christian, then we will begin to get our heads around the miserable failure that is white Christianity. Because as James Cone said a long time ago, you just simply can't be white and Christian. I'll leave it there and, 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 and then we can talk further. And that was one of the quotes that was being thrown at Raphael down in Georgia. Uh, so we, we can come back and talk about that more too. So, yeah. Fred. Well, thank you. And uh, it's really great to join um, you and Kelly uh, Serene, um, in this conversation at this really, really important and critical time in the nation's history. Now, I had the good fortune of traveling to Georgia 
um, the Sunday before the January 5th election of our friend and colleague, union alum, former trustee, Dr. Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. And I did door-to-door -door canvassing uh, during the campaign, uh, observing uh, all COVID-19 protocol, related protocols, of course. And I, I was in Union City, Georgia, not far from Atlanta's airport. Union City, as I experienced it, seemed to be a long time home for Black Georgians with suburban housing and some new, some old, in the midst of an area that was one time mostly rural. I went door to door, inquiring if people had voted and encouraging, encouraging them to vote if they hadn't. And as I went door to door, I sensed a deep, deep, deep commitment on the part of most of the people I talked with to participate in history, to make something happen that needed to happen. I experienced these folks, my folks, black folks in Georgia who seemed determined to do their part and we know they did. Now, of course they didn't do it alone. As Reverend Barber said in a recent social media posting, if every eligible black voter in Georgia had voted, they would only have made up 30% of the electorate. So instead, we had a multiracial coalition that ushered in a new age for Georgia, a coalition that was rooted in the Black theological tradition and Black liberation struggle of the Black church. Brown folks, white folks, Black folks, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, all joined this coalition of liberation inspired by the spirits of Martin King and Coretta Scott King and Fannie Lou Hamer and C.T. Vivian, John Lewis, Diane Dash, James Cone, and then the millions of others who shed blood and gave their lives to make Tuesday, January 5th, happen. And then Wednesday happened, Wednesday came. And there are many ways to perhaps understand this burst of mainly white Christian terror but one thing you can say, as uh, Kelly, you said, it stands in stark contrast and relief to the hope and promise of the day before. My sense is that at the heart of the insurrection and the coup attempt is simply white despair rooted in the wickedness of white supremacy. Terror and despair are the offspring of white supremacy, the children of white supremacy. Dr. King reminded us many times that no lie can live forever. White supremacy is a lie. It's a demonic fraud that has been played upon people who wanted to convince themselves of their own superiority and it has not succeeded and it will never succeed. Just look at its march of destruction and failure, scaffolded on terror and oppression in this country. Each time it has failed. From the white slave owner putting his biracial children on the auction block, children conceived through the systematic rape of slave women, to the most destructive war the country has known in the Civil War, to the decades of the reign of terror in the Jim Crow era, the violent reaction to the civil rights movement, and now another near civil war, insurrection, coup attempt at the nation's capital and in the halls of Congress. The failure of white supremacy breeds despair, which leads to terror. Despair and terror are the progeny of white supremacy. Now, I'm the first to acknowledge that this nation's economic policies have failed many white people and many people in general. And I'll acknowledge the collective fear of the loss of status due to the browning of the population of the United States of America. But the response to these realities cannot be to succumb to the lies and betrayal of a demagogue who occupies the White House and his acolytes who whip up racial and xenophobic fears 
that lead to death and destruction. If domination and control have not worked, are not working, then just doesn't it make sense at a basic level to try something else? What about the mutuality and respect that weaves its way through sermons of the prophets and the life of Jesus? Rather than Christian ministers supporting a president and his acolytes who have lied and deceived as a matter of course, how about calling on his, him and his followers to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream? What do Christian ministers, white Christian ministers who hold up this kind of wickedness expect the results to be for this nation? More domination and control? To what end? Will people eat better, earn more, live better? No, I think the only way out of this is to hear new, the call of the prophets, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. All people of goodwill, all people of goodwill, inspired by the struggle of black Christians Black Americans to make America, America. All of us must join hands and stand against the demonism, the evil, the lie of white supremacy. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Thanks. Yeah, amen, um, amen, amen, amen. You know, I, I uh, it, that is a powerful vision in both such strong statements of truth. And I have to say that uh, the three of us were in conversation as the Capitol was being breached. And even in the full knowledge of all of this, I was like, it was like, oh my God, it, uh, it was, it, it, you almost couldn't comprehend what was happening and yet it made total sense. But it was, I think, for me, um, the fact that it could happen represents a sort of long-standing pair of a sense of white entitlement to what is the capital or white entitlement to what is America. So when you say take back America or don't steal America, the implication is don't steal America from white people and don't let it be stolen by black people. Um, but also I never thought I would find myself yelling at the television saying, cause I'm usually saying, what are the police doing? And instead I was yelling, where are the police? Where, why isn't anyone doing anything? Where the depth of the collusion um, between law enforcement, military, who knows how deep this goes. Um, and then in terms of collusion, all of these sort of um, having the veil of white supremacy pulled off and you can see it in its gross form. Um, the capacity of in the certification process to have members of Congress still stand up after having been threatened within an inch of their life and spew the lies that are racist, white supremacist lies that uh, provoked the violence in the first place. Um, there was, there were some shifts there, but you know, as as someone put it, even in that, even as the veil is pulled off, it's like you want to say to to white America, you know, what is it that 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 people have to come in and rip up your own living room for you to take this seriously? Um, you know, it it's all of these different levels: law enforcement, white entitlement. Um, the inability to take seriously um, the level of violence which Black America knows every single day and to be shocked by it um, when it takes the form it took. Um, I find myself thinking a lot about at this particular moment in time, how do we talk in very concrete terms about accountability and what kinds of actions can be taken just in this specific circumstance to not let it just be all right, this is one more instance in a long narrative of what we know to be the truth about 
white nationalist supremacist America, but actually begin to take actions that, um, you know, tyranny unchecked does not abate by itself. So how do we begin to think about accountability in this context, which is a bigger conversation and a conversation right now in this here and now moment? Yeah, uh, Serene, I think accountability uh, is, is an issue here. Let me say something even more in response to uh, what both you and Fred said. Uh, one, yeah, you know, as and and we were texting through this thing, and so uh, get this event, and uh, as you suggested, uh, Serene, while this may have been a shock to quote unquote white America and surprising, it was not surprising, nor was it a shock to those who have been on the underside of this democratic project uh, in this country. And so it's so amazing to hear the way in which people are talking about the fragility of our democracy in light of uh, the way in which uh, white supremacist terrorists raise their head. Uh, but those people, particularly of color, have always understood that our democracy is fragile because to claim that we are are a democracy has always been aspirational. So what is not clear is that we indeed do want to become a democracy. And so that's where I wanna nuance a little bit, Fred, something you said that white supremacy has not been defeated. And and so until we clearly say that, you know what, that's not who we want to be, we are going to continue to see this raise its head because white supremacy stands embedded into our very American identity. And it is only when white, the privilege of whiteness in some way is threatened that people begin to say, oh, no, 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 no. Our, uh, our democracy is fragile. That's because it's trying Charles Mills has pointed out our democracy has always been a racial contract, always been a racialized democracy. And if we don't believe that, we can look in the Constitution. There was a Three-Fifths Amendment and there was the Fugitive Slave Clause right in the Constitution. So it has always been a limited racialized democracy. So for people on the underside, it's never been a democracy. So that to me is what we have to come to grips with and tell the truth about. Now, who can do that? Because until we tell the truth, then our moral imagination, right, is defined by whiteness so that white privilege becomes synonymous with justice. This is where the white Christian uh, imagination needs to be opened up. And white Christians have to begin to let go of, right? Just as I, I, I borrow this from James Cone, just because you look like a white American don't mean you have to act like one. You don't have to live into that racially defined construct of whiteness that only has an identity in opposition to that which is non-white. White Christian nationalism is able to succeed because good white Christians stand by and say nothing. So when we talk about accountability, I say that those people who look like white Americans who claim to be Christian need to first be accountable to what it means to be Christian and therefore began to let go of and come to grips with their complicity in what happened up there uh, on Capitol Hill. And it's only the, you know, the terror uh, writ large that black people and people of color face every day in this daggone country. And so, you know, that's why so I'll, I'll, I'll say, say this and then shut up, that, that that accountability has to take place. It also means that there is a special role for uh, theological institutions like ours, right? If theology is to hold the faith community accountable to its very faith claims, 
then theological institutions have to indeed be out on the public square holding the faith community accountable to its faith claims. In an institution like ours, not only do we have to have that sort of public uh, voice on, on the public square, it's one of the reasons that EDS at Union has engaged in these just conversations on Facebook. But we also, if we are a seminary as a seedbed for God's more just future, then we also have to prepare our students to be those transformative agents, if you will, in the public square understanding which is, doesn't seem to be at the root, at, at the center of white Christian America, that social justice is not the add-on, as we like to say here at EDS at Union, it is the gospel. So that, that means that we have to begin right here in our seminaries. We have to begin to interrogate this whole thing of white Christian nationalism so that we can begin to open up the Christian imagination. That's the role of seminaries. And I don't know any seminary, and, 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 and you know, I don't want to be self-serving here, but I don't know any seminary for which this is in its very lifeblood than Union and EDS at Union. And so to me, in, in less particularly seminary institutions, white uh, church institutions, unless they began to come to grips with the fact that white Christian nationalism just doesn't happen, that it, that it is nurtured and that our white Christian America has been a seedbed for, well, we are always going to be at this place. So you're right, Serene. When, where has been the white Christian community to call out, not simply what happened on Capitol Hill, that, that was a culmination of, uh, of, of what goes on in this country. Where have they been calling out this kind of white Christian and white terrorist nationalism that has plagued people of color's lives in this country long before them folks found their way up there on Capitol Hill. Yeah, and just to, uh, Kelly, yes, absolutely. And I, I love uh, Cohn's quote about just because you look like a white Christian doesn't mean you have to act like one, um, that it's not just in terms of the accountability um, of white Christians in particular, um, it's not just um, holding accountable those who are on the far right and were on the Capitol lawn doing it in the most blatant form or those who support it quietly and say nothing. But there is also, I think, in the worlds that we inhabit, um, the white Christian perspective that the sort of would be is sort of horrified by what happened on the Capitol and probably horrified by the death of George Floyd, but doesn't see it as part and parcel of the very Christian identity that they inhabit themselves. That it's inextricably linked into it. It's That's not right. a side issue. It's actually, it's in, it's in the marrow of the bones of the faith that they practice, that we have practiced, that is white Christianity in America. And there, there, are other, there are other streams within it that need to grow stronger and burst through it, but it is not, it's, it's, it's not just, um, it's not just one of the many kinds of social justice issues that we have to sit over here and put in our churches in their community service section. It is actually a grappling with the very depth of identity of who we are. No, and Serena, it's, yeah. And it seems to me that a part of that, sort of fundamental to that, is is not the this sort of um, immediate call to on you know to pivot to calls to unity. I mean, yeah. to me, that speaks of the kind of cheap grace that, of course, Bonhoeffer uh, made us all aware of. I mean, what's what should happen now is a call to repentance that everybody who either explicitly or implicitly Ha, has participated in this and participated most recently, needs to stand up and say, first of all, you know, uh, offer the nation a huge apology. And as Chris Coon said the other day, they could start, Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, uh, who is himself a Yale Divinity School graduate, they could start by acknowledging 
that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, a president and president-elect, legitimately um, of this country, um, before they make this pivot to these calls for unity, they could simply stand up and confess that they have lied to the American public. I'm talking about my fellow Christian, Christian clergy, my peer Christian ministers, to say that they supported this lie and then, and, and then uh, tell people the truth. Um, I got someone reached out to me the other day, uh, someone who is a Trump supporter, a person I'm sure is of, of really good will um, about sort of making that bridge. Um, and my point to that person was, you've got some work to do okay. before we can walk across that bridge together. Um, but uh, it, it seems to me what's rooted in this history um, is this notion that we can go from this sort of sustained violence that erupts like it did at the Capitol to suddenly a, um, a position of, 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 of unity and togetherness without any of the kind of transformational repentance um, uh, uh, work that's required uh, to get there. Um, that seems to me to be fundamental to uh, white Christianity in this country, white supremacy in this country, and it perpetuates our inability to make progress. So until there's some real metanoia here, some real turning around, uh, some real uh, uh, embracing of the truth, confessing of, of, of the ways in which uh, Christianity, white Christianity has led this nation astray, I don't see us getting to that moment of reconciliation. Yeah, Fred, I agree. And I, 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 I think the uh, thing to really understand here is that unity, uh, reconciliation, follows justice. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not so interested in uh, white apology uh, as I am interested in real acts and commitments to doing justice, to uh, the recognition, for instance, and doing something about it that the comorbidities that have left uh, uh, people of color more susceptible to COVID uh, than other communities of color uh, or comorbidities of injustice, right? And doing something about that. The other thing to recognize when you talk about violence is that white supremacy is violent. Any ideology uh, or anything that denies uh, the humanity, sacred humanity of another is violent and violence breeds violence. So again, this is no surprise uh, that you would have this kind of eruption of uh, physical violence, if you will, uh, in the Capitol, because violence breeds violence and, and whiteness as an identity construct is a violent identity construct. White supremacy is violent. And so this is no surprise. What, I was just gonna make one pivot and then one, and I'll shut, I promise, I'll shut up. That this is something, you know, it's interesting because what we're saying, and particularly in terms of Christianity and whiteness and Christianity and calling, calling out this construct and really calling us to a place of justice, uh, which means first figuring out the sin, right, and how we got there. This is what Black theology has said all along with this goal of a more just future. Uh, the, and it's ironic because this is the very thing, right? That Raphael got called out for, right? And, and, and the reason that he would be called out for it, and of course we know it was taken out of context and, and all of that, is because you are going to get called out for, for speaking the truth. And in actual fact, Raphael uh, was being called out for making the proclamations uh, that lie at the center of the black faith tradition, as this is a tradition that has always resisted uh, this notion that 
uh, uh, you can have uh, uh, white whiteness, uninterrogated whiteness uh, and Christianity come together in such a way that it doesn't distort uh, the very nature of Christianity and who we are called to be as sacred people of God. Black theology is always valued and starts in the premise that we are all uh, sacred children of God. And so what do we have to do uh, to become a nation in this instance where we're all respected as such? So it's interesting that, Ra that they critiqued Raphael, right? But the very things that Raphael was speaking about and that black theology talks about, if they had listened to Raphael, perhaps what had happened on uh, the Capitol uh, could have been averted. Well, for, for, to me, what was so um, just stark about the attacks on Raphael using James Cohn and black theology is white supremacy, the monster was using black theology to turn Raphael into the monster, playing off 400 years worth of fears um, of black bodies. And you know, all you have to do is say that Raphael Warnock believes in black liberation. It would be like you're saying, Raphael Warnock wants to drop a nuclear bomb on the United States. I mean, it, you know, it, it, had, it has a history of having that kind of power of demonizing him. Now, what was so remarkable was that for some people, I'm sure that rhetoric worked, um, but uh, it didn't work uh, okay. in the big picture. Um, that wasn't, that is not who he is. Um, he is a, a, a black theologian with a mighty voice and um, and he is a student of, of Jim's, which we're very proud of, and he is a prophetic voice. Um, but to, it, it, you know, back to Fred's point, it, it, it bounced off and, and hit white supremacy back in the face. And, the, and I think the- Of demonizing. Uh, and the other piece of good news here, it seems to me, Serena and Kelly, is that um, the very thing that they criticize Raphael for was a thing that sustained him in the midst of all of that and let him walk this, this way with a lot of grace and dignity. Um, you did not hear one counter attack from Raphael that was of the nature of those that were leveraged at him. Um, and that's, that's deeply rooted um, in the black religious tradition. I mean, deeply rooted in this notion that, um, that you can't overcome a lie with another lie, uh, that you can't overcome violence with necessarily more violence, deeply rooted uh, in this notion that the uh, spiritualities and, 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 and principalities against which we fight uh, have to be overcome uh, with something more and something greater and not more, more of the same. So, so that, you know, that, um, that, faith that Raphael got from his, um, you know, his uh, preacher parents uh, to, um, to that sort of intellectual underpinning and, and uh, the, the, the sweep of black history he got at Morehouse. And then the, the notions and, 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 and approaches to understanding um, the, the, the more liberative uh, aspects of our faith through his time at Union and with James Cone you know, the, those very things that those people attacked were the things that made him the candidate and the person that he was, and hopefully the senator, you know, that he's going to be. And the, 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 the wonderful thing to me about his campaign is he never backed down. He never backed down on his vision of uh, a, a, an, inclu an, inclusive, an inclusive society and, and a just society. Um, so, you know, and somebody asked him, he said, uh, you know, are you going to give up your pulpit? And, and what his response was, you know, uh, no, I, I plan to be in it every Sunday. He said, because I feel like if I don't do anything but hang out with politicians, I might become one. Uh, what he's depending on is that, that, that faith walk uh, and that tradition uh, uh, to, to keep him grounded and, and, and to help him maintain a perspective. Um, and I'll just say this and I'll stop. I think that's the, 
that's the gift of this black liberation struggle to this country. Um, that, um, you know, we don't always get it right, um, but we know the sort of source uh, and the power uh, for being able to keep on keeping on uh, in the midst of some of the most horrendous and horrific uh, circumstances, um, even today. Um, and we could go on and sort of catalog and list those, but we don't have time. Um, but this is, um, this is a moment. This is a moment to uh, reveal the demonic um, nature and lie that white supremacy is, but it's also a moment to um, claim the gifts that um, Christianity well lived uh, and as, ex and as a exemplified in this black liberation struggle, the gift that it can be. And to call again, all people of goodwill uh, to, to grab hands and, 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 and let's, let's get on with this thing and let's be motivated, motiv motivated by the design, the goals uh, of the people who fought to make this country, for, to, to live up to his creed uh, as so, so many of our um, forebearers have, have attested. Fred, I, I want to pick up from what you say as I see that we're getting signaled to uh, right. say the last word and, and, and you've given me a good transition in this regard to say the last word. The other thing you see, I think that we saw in uh, Raphael's campaign and in the election that took place in Georgia, not only in terms of this runoff election, but uh, in the uh, national election, uh, uh, is this movement, right, of uh, Black people coming to the polls, and in particular, uh, Black women, as they make up uh, the greater proportion of the Black electorate. And what it reminds me of, and it's, it's Raphael's, that's Raphael's move to keep himself rooted in the Black church, is the core of Black theology of liberation. And that is understanding, and it's the core of the Christian tradition. And that is understanding that God, as we understand God, the God that made God self known through the one who was crucified, that that indicates to us God's utter, yes, solidarity with the oppressed, those on the underside of justice, the crucified classes of people, if you will, as they move toward freedom. And because what we see, and we see it uh, manifest in these last two elections, people talk about how uh, the black community, how black women have saved democracy, or uh, and 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 the and and we get you know throughout Black history, it's those black those people who've not enjoyed democracy that try to keep the vision for democracy alive. That's what the preferential option of the poor. That's what a god on the side of the oppressed. That's what that means, because here's what it means. It means that if we are ever going to know justice, then that movement toward justice has to start with those people who have experienced it the least or not at all. Otherwise, we began to confuse justice with the privileges that have indeed come and come from an unjust society. That's why the movement toward God's more just future has gone through the cross. That's what the cross is all about. That's what black theology makes clear. That's what we have seen manifest, the very movement of God as the oppressed, as the black community in this regard came to the polls in droves to say, you know what? We are trying to claim what democracy ought to be and can be. And that is a community, a society that moves us just a little bit closer to the more just future that God promises us all. So I'll stop there. Amen. Amen. Amen and of
what else is what else there's so much more to say and yet what else in this moment is there to say i would just want to lift up this one image that sticks with me um it was during the debate um that Raphael was having and it, um, the candidate running against him was repeating the phrase that she would repeat over and over again. Well, I, I can't even remember, it was a, the, le, the liberal socialist Raphael Warnock and she must have said it 20 times in the debate and she pulled out scripture but misquoted it and it, it was just, it was, it was, it had a sense of the surreal to it. There's so many ways that you could respond to that. But looking at Raphael at one point, he just looked at her and he just shook his head and smiled and chuckled and came back to what we needed to be talking about. And that sense of being grounded in something that is so much bigger than the idiocy and the attacks, that is that grounding that is the God that was crucified on the cross that is the God of the underside. And that is not just, again, an appendage to the faith, it is the heart of the faith. So thank you both. Thank you everyone who's listened to this uh, for being part of our talk amongst ourselves. Um, and we, we look forward to hearing your talk amongst yourselves and to continuing this uh, conversation. Um, so. Blessings to you and keep up the struggle and amen and amen. Thank you. Thanks so everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Are we still on Robin? I thought you all might have stayed on to debrief. Are we off?